as I'm coming down, I see like fire burning. And I like, I speed up and I'm freaking out and I'm thinking my house is on fire and there's a, a full on, probably a six by eight cross, six to the side, eight tall, eight feet tall, completely engulfed in fire in my front yard and my mom's inside with my sister's daughter. So I grew up in a very small town uh, named Cuba, Missouri, um, 87 miles outside of St. Louis, Missouri. An all white town, town of 3,000 people. Mm -hmm. Almost all white. Almost all white. <laughs> Without me and my sisters, it would be a, a albino town completely. What was that like? It was shitty and 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 thrilling, and you know, I can't help but feel grateful for all the wild things that I got to do. You know what I mean? It's just, it was a different reality. Like even. Even now, Missouri is at least five to six years in the past from California. Uh -huh. So, like, they're still now catching on to things that we've been doing for years because they just, like, they still burn their trash. They don't recycle. They don't have recycling companies. Like, it's, it's very, it's very in the past. These are Stone Age people. They're, they're hillbillies that don't care to change. And they don't want to change. And they don't care about your opinion. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And so, it was, it was rough. Uh, from from my youngest memories, I never felt like I was a part of anything. Mm -hmm. Like I, I remember the first time I ever got in trouble in school was because um, all the all the kids in school had like this ramp at the end of their at the end of their hair. They would like they, it was the, it was the blonde tip season, and they would dye the tips of their hair blonde, and then they would make like this little ramp at the end of their head. It was in. It was like the that was cool. It was the cut, you know. And I was convinced that I could make it happen. One of my friends told me about gel, and he's like, dude, you just put gel on it, and it, like, stays. And so, like, the morning before school, I go into the bathroom, and I break into my sister's cabinet, and I, like, get her gel, and I'm, like, I'm gelling my afro, right? And I'm, like, and I'm brushing it, and I'm trying to get it to, like, just stay in this, like, ramp position. And I ended up having to basically cast mold <laughs> my hair with gel, just like straight up and down, you know? And there was so much gel in my hair that when I got on the school bus, um, I put my head on the seat and it left like a glob of gel on the seat. And after I got off, off the school bus, I got called into the office and they wrote me up and they gave me ISS. I think it was like the second or third grade. It's the first time I ever got an ISS. ISS is? ISS is in school suspension. For those are, it's trouble. For those good kids that never, <laughs> for the good ones that never had to get in trouble in school. But yeah, I spent a lot of time in ISS, <laughs> mainly because I'm a bit of a rebel. I feel like as a, at a young age, I didn't feel like I was a part and adults didn't see me as one of them, you know, and so they treated me differently. It was very blatant and obvious. One of them is in like a, like a white like person? Just, just like a, a person, like I was less than or I was different. Like they would, you know what I mean? Like it was very obvious that people would single me out because I just wasn't like everybody else. Didn't look like everybody else when I walked into a room. Everybody looks because I'm different. I'm the first black guy they've ever seen. You yeah. know what I mean? They've only heard stories, you know what I mean? And their parents have only heard stories. So, like, it was the whole trifecta of... And then once I found out... Because when you're young, you think, like, adults are gods. And they, like... They know. They know everything. And they're right. And they're, they're, they're good. And, like, they're there for you, you know? And that reality shattered for me at such a young age. The first time I saw a teacher, like, be, like, racially discriminatory against me, like, blatantly only me and it was like hate driven like when you see it in somebody's eyes that they like they hate you for like you didn't do anything to them you don't know them um it made it very difficult to try to like like you know when do you start dating as a kid you know you date at like what fourth grade fifth grade is when you start getting girlfriends and like little things and like all my friends i they started calling me the love doctor because nobody wanted to date me because they would i mean they did don't get me wrong. <laughs> you did girls, okay. hey, gir uh, girls wanted to date me, uh -huh. but their parents wouldn't let them date me. Wow. Like I've had legitimately, it was my sophomore year of high school, and there was this girl that 
had liked me a lot and she wanted to date me and her parents, she told me, and this was the like, the line I would get from girls that I liked. I'd be like, can we date and like hold hands, <laughs> you know? And they'd be like, Ugh, I can't because my, my parents will disown me. That was the thing, that was the like saying, you know what I mean? And I was like, whatever, whatever, whatever. And then there was this one girl I really liked and um, we used to like sneak to the like, uh, like back parking lot and I would get in her car and she would drive away and take like a back road and she would just, we would just like make out. We never like had sex or anything, but we would just like hold hands and make out Your when kids. nobody was around. Yeah, I mean, we were kids. I mean, I was in high school, I was still like whatever, but um, <laughs> basically like, I was like, I don't give a shit what your parents say. Like, I, I want to be with you, and I don't see why, I don't, I don't understand why I can't, you know? So, I don't care. I'm going to hold your hand at the basketball game. I'm going to, you know, whatever. And, um... Just do normal shit. The, the normal shit, you know? And because I'm human, you know? Leave me alone. And the day it caught up with me, her dad found out that we were, like, like together and hanging out. And I just finished a football game, and I'm walking off the field of the football game, mind you, my dad wasn't around, and my mom was working three jobs. So, like, football game, I've never had one person ever come to, a, like, a, a meet or a game or a competition that I, like, so it was, like, a, it was a different thing. So I was alone, and I'm walking off the field, and I say that because I feel like if my dad or mom would have been there, it would have been a bigger deal. But I'm walking off the field, and I have my helmet in my hand, and I feel this tap on my shoulder, and I turn around, and it's the girl's dad. And he's a grown man. Full beard, Levi jeans, button down shirt, tucked in, belt, belt buckle, one of those. Mm -hmm. And um, he taps me on the shoulder and I turn around and he goes, you ever touch my daughter, I'll hang you from a fucking tree, nigger. <sighs> and I like, it like, it shook me. I was like, like I, I was legitimately scared that this grown man was about to hurt me. No, you know what I mean? And, been, and yeah. yeah, and like I, I looked over at my like assistant principal and I was like, hey, I'm like, hey, come here. Like, this guy just threatened me on the field. He said, like, e e you know what I mean? And my principal was just like, what, do you want to, like, do you want me to call the cops? Or, and I'm like, y yeah. You know? And so that was my, that was my initial break into the, like, okay, I'm not one of them, you know? And they're not going to stand up for me. And, and you know what I mean? Like, he, that was the fracturing moment in my life where I realized that, like, a part of me, like, real, like, believe that I was right like I wasn't wrong for just being who I am I was right in that scenario where I was just wanting wanting to be a kid you know what I mean mm -hmm. so it it really fractured my reality at a young age and so now as an adult I'm thankful for that because it 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 disables me from following the crowd because when the whole crowd of people are telling me that I'm no good or I'm less than or I'm this or I'm that, it's like in that moment I knew that they were wrong because mm -hmm. I was a, a value, a caring, loving human being that, you know, had no ill intentions. I just wanted to be cared about as a person, you know. So ultimately if my goal is to, is to help you understand where I'm at, I can't come at you in any way, shape or form. It has to be like an understanding. Mm -hmm. Like, hey, let me hear you out. Let me hear where you come from. Why, why do you feel that way? And you feel like your experiences from your childhood brought you to that place? Absolutely. That was the main reason why I can perceive those reality switches because that reality was shattered at such a young age. It made me question a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And I'm thankful. Like, I feel like I wouldn't... I was having this conversation with you earlier. I feel like I wouldn't be the person that I am if I would have grown up in a place like this. Like a place like this is, you know, this is my, this is my happy place. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like dreams come true and play kids are running around naked, some naked, some not naked, some screaming, some breaking things. Like, it's just like, it's a happy environment. It's the reality that I wished I could have had when I was a kid. But then when I wish that, I'm like, I wonder what that would have produced for me. Mm -hmm. I, because I believe that struggle produces greatness mm -hmm. like the the refinedness of somebody who's been through something so hard make gives that person the opportunity to evolve mm -hmm. and the more opportunities you have to evolve the more opportunities that you say yes to to evolve the greater chance at being a better human being you're going to get from my perspective so 
I'm nothing but thankful for all of the 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 racism and the the KKK and like all of my the KKK. Yeah. You had experiences with them. I did have experiences with them. The KKK. The KKK. What is it called when sponsors? The KKK sponsors the main road running through the town, twenty miles from the town that I grew up in. Mm. And being one of the only black kids in the whole school, when I played Sullivan, is the name of the town, Sullivan, Missouri. I hope you're watching. Sure. Hope you evolved. I broke the fourth wall. <laughs> it's all good. Um, he knows there's a camera in front of him, people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, they sponsor the main road there. They set, they have meetings. They're very involved in the community. It's a it's a it's alive and well. What happened was is I played a football game. I was I played running back. I didn't have to try out for the team. They're like, he's black, put him on the team. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're like, give him the ball. We'll see what he does. Pass him the rock. See what he does with it, right? And fucked so, up part was you're pretty good. <laughs> I was pretty good. So, um, and they were right. Racism isn't wrong all the time. Um, but I was running back and receiver for kickoffs, and it was the first kickoff of the game, and. They kicked it to the other guy who was receiving. Usually there's two receivers in the back, and I'm one, and they kicked it to the other guy. Well, when he went to try to catch it, it went between his legs, and I was running in that direction to block for him anyway. Like, I'm in intersection to block for this guy who's supposed to catch the ball. He drops the ball. It goes right between his legs, but his momentum carried him forward, and so I saw the ball on the ground, and I've been trained, scoop and score, baby. <laughs> you know, so I grab the ball and and I take off running and it seems like there's a there's a magic moment moment sorry there's a magic moment that happens in football when you're when you have the ball and you're trying to score and then like everybody's in front of you and they're trying to get you and they're trying to stop you you know and then for just a moment you'll see it like open up like a like a like a red sea you'll just see the hole open and you're like this is it. Like, this is, nobody's between me and scoring right now. You know what I mean? And so I picked up the ball, and I saw that gap, and I hit it, and I'm running as fast as I can, right? And I'm, I'm, at, I'm at the 50. I'm at the 60. I'm at the 70, right? And I'm thinking I slowed down a little bit because I'm thinking there's nobody behind me. They gave up. You know what I mean? And, and I'm running. And I, I get to the 70, and all of a sudden I feel this, like, dude just, like, jump on my head and back, and I just, like, crumbled to the ground. But still, that was probably one of the best returns that we had ever had that season, you know? And then my coach took me out of the game. And I, I'm on the sideline, pumped up, because I just, you know what I mean? I, I think it was more than, you know, 85 yards that I ran from the goal. From the goal. So, like, my heart is beating, and I'm ready, and I'm ready to get, put me in the game, coach, you know? And he wouldn't put me in the game. And mm -hmm. I never understood why. And, and now looking back on it, I understand. He knew what he did in that moment. He let everybody in the stands see who was on the field. Mm -hmm. you know, because not only was I the only black kid on the field, but I was the only black person in the stands. Mm -hmm. In a town sponsored by the KKK. Right, it says it right on the road as you drive by, sponsored wow. by the KKK, and they pick up trash. They go out with their hoods and they pick up trash on certain days. Right, it's real and it's alive. Mm -hmm. And long story long, the game ends, and I go home. And my mom was visiting with my sister who had just died. My sister had got hit by a car. She was 16 years old. I was 14 at the time. She got hit by a car, and. Um, so my mom was in town visiting with my daughter. I lived by myself at the time because um, my mom worked so much, but she came into town that weekend to see me. Didn't come to the game, but she was there. And I'm sitting there and I'm hanging out with my sister's daughter who had, had passed away like a year before at this time. And my phone rings, you know, and I pick up the phone and I'm like, hey, what's up? I don't, I, this is before caller ID and shit. You just picked up the fucking phone. <laughs> I just picked it up. And I'm like, hey, who's this? You know, and they were like... Um, what kind of tree, pardon my French, um, vulgar, explicit language, he said, um, what kind of tree you want to hang from, nigger? Whoa. And I'm like, at first, like, my reaction was like, all right, like, who, Where like, we? who is, like, who is it, like, quit playing around, like, ha ha, you had your laugh, like, 
quit fucking around. What's up? You know, and that was my that was my energy. Mm-hmm. Anyway, um, they asked me what kind of tree I wanted to hang from, and then they said, you know, your sister was a whore. And when they said that, I saw red. I um, I got in my car with my bat, and my mom had heard what the conversation was that happened. And I ran out of the door, and I grabbed this bat, and I got in my car because they said, meet me at the rock quarry, which was behind the truck stop in town. And so I get in my car, and I'm flying down this road, which, looking back at it, not a good idea, right? <laughs> I was going to go out swinging, you know? And, like, I, I was, you know what I mean? It didn't I was matter at this point. Full rage, full yeah. rage. And I'm probably halfway in town, and the police call me. And they say, hey, your mom just called us, told us everything that's going on. Meet us at the McDonald's, you know? And in a small town, like, ever, all the cops were there, right? So now I'm not only speeding, but now I'm speeding to the police, a better plan. <laughs> Ones up with me not being dead. I'm speeding to the police so they can get to this guy, you know what I mean? And I... I'm driving faster than I should have been, obviously, and there was a police, there was a state trooper on the up ramp, and he said that he clocked me going 97 and a 70. Mind you, I'm only, I'm only 16 years old, and so he had no right to be able to do what he did to me. Long story short, I ended up getting a gun pulled on me. I, I pulled into the parking lot where the police were, the state trooper pulls in, pulls his gun on me, tells me to get the fuck on the ground. I get on the ground. He puts me in handcuffs, puts me in the back of his car. And um, he, he basically threatened me for over an hour saying that, that what, I, what I was going through, I told him everything that happened, why I was going to meet the police, everything. And he explained to me very long and detailed like, that that was not a life or death situation and I could have hurt many people in this scenario and that that was no justification to do any of the things that I did and he wrote me a ticket for going 97 and a 70. Mm -hmm. And I finally get to the police, tell them where the car is, they go look for the car, the car's not there, the police come back, they hand me this note with a business card and they say, "If if they call again, call us back. We don't know anything we can do for you in this moment, they're not there. And so I'm like, I just got this ticket and I'm like, whatever. And he couldn't take me to jail because I was only 16. Anyway, I drive, I drive home. And as I hit the top of my road coming down, it's a country road, so there's nothing but stars and light. As I'm coming down, I see like burning. And I like, I speed up and I'm freaking out and I'm thinking my house is on fire and there's a, a full on, probably a six by eight cross, six side, eight tall eight feet tall, completely engulfed in fire in my front yard, in my mom's inside with my sister's daughter. And I called the cops again. Hey, guys, there's a, there's like, they know where I live now. It's like, what do I do? And they're like, well, if anything else happened, put the fire out. If anything else happens, you let us know. Wow. And wow. so it ultimately changed my perspective of people, police, and, and it, it helped me become the loving, understanding, generous human being that I am. Yeah, because knowing you, I've never seen you harbor any resentment, anything like that. It's really amazing that you've just, like, not taken a victim mentality and just, like... I mean, at the end of the day, that's all we got. Wow. You can be sad every day for the rest of your life if you want to. Yeah. If you, if you want to give in to that, feel free. But just know in the same regard, you could be happy every day for the rest of your life, no matter mm-hmm. what. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for sharing Thanks, your story. Jacob. Here, wait. Jacob, I love you, brother. I love you. Here, check out the drawing. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, dun, dun. This is my A. Hey, do you guys see this? This is, the fa- this is the best one out of all the ones. I mean, you could vote online or not, but this is definitely the best one. <laughs> I've watched the other ones. This one is my fave. Can I keep this? Yeah, that's for you, bro. Yeah. All right. Thanks, bro. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Love you, dog. Love you. Much love. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Always.